Well, hello. I want to thank uh, Kyle for just an awesome series that he taught us on the tongue uh, the past four weeks. It was just incredible. It was very convicting and, uh, and, and yet very encouraging. We're really, we're really blessed. I just loved every one of those messages and, and hit me right between the eyes. I also want to thank you for your prayers for the North American Christian Convention out in Anaheim a few weeks ago. The conference went really well. Uh, thousands of Christian leaders were challenged and refreshed. And, uh, Kyle did a morning Bible study each day, and Brian Seitz led worship. And our Bible Bowl teams uh, did exceptionally well in their competition. We had several folks from church that uh, led workshops, and dozens of you all were there. But uh, I want to thank you for your prayers for that. After that was over, our, our family, we took a few days and just kind of collapsed and, and uh, just took some time away, and we went to a, a place called Big Bear Lake in California. I, now, I'd never been there. I didn't see a bear while I was there, but uh, it's a really cool place, about two hours uh, north of, of L.A., and it's kind of in the mountains, and we had a really relaxing time there for about four or five days, but one night, uh, Beth and I were out for a walk and while we were walking, all of a sudden, this was late at night, Beth just stopped. And she went like this. And, and I looked, and there were two coyotes just staring at us. And so it was kind of a frightening moment. And, uh, but as you can tell, I survived and, and made it. And, uh, but I am going to miss Beth. Um, <laughs> no, this is terrible. I mean, we've been... <laughs> We've been married for 30 years, and the very, when I saw the coyote, the first thought I had was, I just need to outrun her. You know, that, that is terrible to even have that thought, but uh, everything was cool, and they just kind of looked at us, and I, I tried to get a picture of them, and Beth's like, come on, let's go, let's go, but we had a really uh, relaxing time. It's always good to be away from home for a while, but it is so good when you come back, and there's, there's no place like Southeast, and so it uh, makes me love you guys more when I'm away for a while, and I appreciate everything that you all uh, do in this community and for Christ. Uh, we're kicking off a brand new series. It's, uh, it's out of the book of First Peter, and uh, we're going to focus on the topic of hope. And I have entitled this series, Finding Hope in a World of Hurt, because we find ourselves in uh, very uncertain times in, in our world. And we experience a, a lot of hurts in this world. Some are relational, others are physical, some are emotional, but it just seems that the season that we are in as a nation is more painful than, than normal. And we are surrounded by political unrest and and, and, and racial division and economic uncertainty. And the end result is that each day our nation seems to become more polarized and paralyzed. Now, a few embrace a fairy tale uh, approach to our situation. They somehow believe that, well, you know, after the presidential election, on Wednesday, November 9th, all the animosity will subside, all parties will shake hands and sing three verses of kumbaya and hug each other, and I, I'm not holding my breath on that. In fact, both presidential candidates of the major parties are, are very opposite, and yet both have the highest unlikability factors of any presidential candidates in, in recent decades. And so it doesn't take a rocket scientist to to realize that 45% of the country will, will be more agitated or discouraged uh, after the election. And may I point out that as Christians, we're at the same place we always have been. Whether you're cheering for a presidential candidate, whether you're looking at your weekly paycheck, whether you are pursuing a graduate degree, whether you are trying to attain to that office uh, that, that you look at and you see with a nice window and you say, boy, I, I, I wish I had that spot. Whatever it might be, all of those things uh, cannot provide us with a lasting hope. And so we're going to have to look for our hope elsewhere because those things aren't alive and they're not lasting. So it wouldn't matter if the presidential candidates were the most liked candidates of all time. Our hope still needs to be in something that is lasting and something that is living because preachers 
Politicians and people will always let you down. We're human. That's what happens. Stock markets crash. New cars depreciate. Houses deteriorate. Supermodels get wrinkles. <laughs> Olympic sprinters, gymnasts, and divers, 20 years from now, they may have an ounce of fat on their belly. They may. Uh, and so things will change. We can't put our hope in that which is physical. We can't put our hope in that which is material. And when we think from a spiritual perspective, we have to realize that regardless of who sits in the White House next year, we can't be blind to what is gradually taking place throughout our culture. We've seen it for years. A Christian worldview seems to be fading in our nation. Sold out believers for Christ are in the decreasing minority. The battering ram of society continues to chip away and the laws and the trends of our time are going to test your convictions in the workplace like never before. So this is a warning. You are going to need to determine your priorities and where your hope is because there is going to be an escalation of challenges and tension for those who boldly claim to be Christ followers. Now the opening verses of 1 Peter reveal that Simon Peter, one of Christ's closest friends, one of his disciples, has written this letter to Christians who are scattered around the world who have found themselves marginalized and discriminated against and homeless and persecuted and mocked and questioned, many of them unemployed now because of their belief in Christ and because of their peculiar lifestyle. And Peter writes to remind them that their hope is in the resurrected Christ, not in the empire who killed Christ. And so Peter writes this letter to those Christians who have been forced to flee and run for their lives. And they've gone to five different provinces. It's what we think of now as modern-day Turkey. So turn in your, in your Bible app or in your, your Bible to 1 Peter. It's in the very back of your Bible. If you find Revelation, it's just a few pages before the book of Revelation. It was written back in the uh, mid-60s A.D. And if you're a history buff, then you're well aware of what took place in 64 A.D. There was a huge fire in Rome. It burnt almost everything. But it left Nero's estate unscathed. It also left... Nero's best friend's estate unscathed as well. So it raised a lot of suspicion with people in Rome. And in order to divert some of the scrutiny and blame in an effort to stop people from questioning him and why he didn't lose anything in the fire, Nero had to find a scapegoat. And so he and his advisors chose to blame the fire on the Christians. And they twisted the rhetoric in an effort to make Christians look like something that they weren't. And so Nero's marketing people had three angles that they used. They said that, that this new religion of Christianity was, was truly atheistic. You say, why would they say it was atheistic? Well, because they believed in one God rather than in many gods. And so they said, look how different they are. We all believe in many gods. They only believe in one God. The second thing that they did was they claimed that the Christians were cannibals. You say, how, how would that get any traction? Well, because when they took the Lord's Supper, they would drink Jesus' blood and they would eat his body. And that's what they said about them. The third thing that they said about the Christians was the fact that they had incestuous relationships. You say, where would that come from? Because they said, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. And so they labeled them as an extremist fringe group that was really out there, and they tagged them with the crime of arson, and they succeeded in making Christians look like something that they weren't. Sound familiar? Happens today. The ones with the megaphones and the microphones sometimes falsely label Christians as judgmental, homophobic, hateful, radical, out of touch, Anything to paint Christians to look like something that they are not. Now, back in the first century, in order to carry out the, the ruse and make the arson allegation really more believable, Nero chose to be brutal to Christians. And as a result of it, the early second century historian Tacitus writes about Nero burning Christians alive as torches to light his gardens at night, feeding them to wild animals for public entertainment. In all, he probably murdered thousands of Christians in Rome. 
And it's during this season of persecution that Peter writes his letter to those who have been fleeing to escape from Nero. And his writing can prepare us on how to handle suffering and live out our faith. Because in the coming years, we will become a marginalized minority and we will be a persecuted people. So let's discover in this book of 1 Peter, as we begin, how we can find our hope in the world of hurt. And let's look at two different sections. Here's the first section. What is the source of the believer's hope? What's the source of the believer's hope? Look with me in your Bible at, at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So as believers, we've been born again into Christ's family and there are some really cool implications that go with that. We are heirs to an inheritance that the God of the universe has for us. And he's very crystal clear in stressing that this inheritance is safe and secure. And Peter uses a military term to describe how that inheritance is kept and guarded in heaven for you. And God is keeping it and he is protecting it for you. And it can never perish, spoil, or fade. I have a house, but in 100 years or so, that house will perish. I can get food out of my refrigerator. I can sit on the counter. I can come back to eat it a couple days later, and, and that food will have spoiled. I, I have baseballs that I collected when I was a little kid where I would get a, an athlete to, to sign that. But over decades, those autographs, they, they start to fade. And in First Peter, he points out to us that Christians... That God has promised you that there is something that will never perish, spoil, or fade. Now, if I read that passage quickly, and if I talk about the inheritance that we will receive in heaven, then if we're not careful, we'll think that that's our living hope. That heaven is our living hope. But friends, as great as heaven is, and as priceless as your inheritance there will be, that's not the living hope that is the centerpiece of this chapter. We sometimes get confused and we think, well, our hope is in heaven, kind of, but that's not our ultimate hope. Your, your, your hope is not in heaven. Your hope is not in your athletic achievements. Your hope is not in your job security. It's not in the Pinterest wedding that you're planning. It's, it's not the two years you spent designing and building your dream home. I mean, I'm excited for you. Congratulations. I hope you use it to love where you are, but I've got news for you. Your living hope isn't found in a place, it's found in a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. Because he made our salvation possible through his death on the cross and through his resurrection. And it's easy to start looking for hope in all the wrong places. That's why we need to stay in the word. That's why we need to, to stay in, in church and weekly worship. That's why we need to study the Bible together because it's possible for us to lose our way and in the process we start to feel hopeless. I've thoroughly enjoyed watching the Olympics the past couple of weeks. And it's just a, it, it's fun at night just to tune into that. And, and How many of you have watched the Olympics? Just put your hands up. Wow, that's a, that's a whole lot of you. And I'm, I'm telling you what, the stories are just so compelling and riveting. They'll show some story, the backstory of this athlete, and then the athlete competes. And I mean, I am a goner. I'm just a mess. Beth will come in and I'll, I'll just have tears running down my face. Just say, what, what happened? What happened? Just, oh, oh. Oh. You know, and I've become an expert. I watch for two minutes and all of a sudden I'm an expert. Oh, no, no. Too big of a splash. No, too big of a splash. I just watch baptisms and I said the same thing. Too big of a splash. You know, I, I'm messed up, you know? But I, I enjoy watching these things. And after the race is over, the guy goes and he hugs his dad and the crowd and they're both crying. And man, it just it wipes me out. We love stories of hope. What the most compelling story was to me in this Olympics, it was a story of hopelessness. 
And ironically, it's centered around the most decorated Olympian of all time, Michael Phelps. Back in 2014, when Phelps had already at that point earned 22 medals, twice as many as the closest of all time. And uh, it was just incredible because uh, Phelps got his second DUI in 2014 and a downward spiral ensued, leaving him feeling the lowest, he says, that he had ever felt. He was so embarrassed, he was struggling to figure out who he was outside of the swimming pool, and all this led to him drinking heavily, and he later told ESPN that he wondered whether his life was worth living, and he contemplated suicide. Phelps said, I thought the world would just be better off without me. I figured that was the best thing to do, just to end my life. Uh, can I just say, as an aside, if you ever hear a voice say that to you in your mind, that is Satan's voice, and it is a voice straight from the pit of hell. And do not give it any attention. Don't go that direction. But around that time in Michael Phelps' life, a former NFL football player who had had some personal demons of his own to overcome recommended a book for Michael Phelps to read is a Christian book, The Purpose Driven Life, written by uh, Rick Warren. And Phelps started reading it, and he checked himself into a treatment center. And while he was there, he gained the nickname of Preacher Mike because every day he would read some excerpt from the book to everybody and make them listen to the others in the recovery program. Now, I, I, I don't know where he is in his faith, I have no idea. But I do know that throughout the book he read, Rick Warren stresses time and time again about finding your hope and your purpose in Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that Phelps has changed directions and he's no longer struggling with feeling hopeless. For the Christian, our hope is alive. And in verse six of this text, there's a shift that takes place at, at this point because Peter talks about the attitude we should have because of this living hope of Christ. And it says in verse six, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. And when Peter says that we should rejoice in this, you have to look back at the previous verses and realize he's referring to, to Jesus Christ, his resurrection and the implications of that, the eternal inheritance we can have. In other words, he's comparing temporary trials with eternal reward. And really there's no comparison. But living hope isn't just about tolerating the temporary in order to earn the eternal. It's about how we live in the face of true adversity and even death. And the only way we can do that is by holding on to our living hope, the person of Jesus Christ. You see, hope isn't just about the future. It's about the present. When things at work overwhelm you, when a friend betrays you, when your family is at a crossroads, when the womb is barren, when a neighbor turns on you, as painful as those times are, this is an opportunity for faith to shine and for hope to live. Verse six says, in this you, you greatly rejoice because you have a living hope. You aren't celebrating the suffering, you are celebrating what in this refers to, that Jesus is our living hope. There's a lady in our church raised her grandson along with her husband. And uh, just a few months ago, as a teenager, he died in a car accident. Last month, her, uh, her husband passed away unexpectedly. And I called her up just a few days ago and said, hey, I'm just checking on you. I just wanted to see how, you, how you're doing. And she said, you know what? God is so faithful and... Uh, Different folks just continue to reach out to me, and I don't know how I can say this, but I'm really making it, and, 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 and she said, it's tough, and there are painful days, and I know there's gonna be really tough times ahead, but then she said this, she said, but you know what, Dave? She said, God is so good. And I hung off the phone, and I thought, how can she say God is so good in light of what's happened to her in the last nine months? Well, she can say that because Jesus is her living hope. 
and because both of those guys shared that same living hope. You see, the Christian's hope is alive. A living hope, you cannot see it. A dying hope, you see them all around, and we get excited about those things, and the the world promises multiple dying hopes, and we get our hopes up, only to realize that the, the team doesn't satisfy us, and when it's all said and done, it's not lasting. But even though for a little while, compared to eternity, I might experience trials, He is reminding us to keep our trials and suffering in perspective against the backdrop of our relationship with the one who offers eternal salvation. Here's the second half of of, of this section. Not just the source of the believer's hope, but the strengthening of the believer's faith. How does that take place? Well, one of the ways it happens is through tests and trials and even through persecution. So in God's paradoxical way, he teaches hope through suffering. And Peter says, in this, you you greatly rejoice. Look in your Bible at the next verse, verse seven. These have come, talking about the trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's the end goal. The end result of an active faith of this living hope we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that our soul is saved. And nothing is more important than than receiving salvation through Jesus Christ. And the words here where it says, so that, in verse seven, indicate the purpose of what Peter is talking about. These have come, these trials come into your life, suffering comes into your life, rough times, difficult circumstances, they come into your life and they provide us with opportunities that allow God to strengthen our faith. And some of you are listening to this sermon and and you're thinking, "I, I, I don't think I can praise God, I don't think I can say God is so good in the midst of my trial. I mean, I am literally in a world of hurt right now. Maybe you feel like your marriage is on its last leg. Or maybe you've had a diagnosis from a doctor and it just seems like all of the medical odds are stacked against you, but your desire is for God to miraculously intervene because he's your only hope. And still for others of you, your world of hurt It's about 40 hours a week where your beliefs are berated and your morals are maligned. And if you're not careful over time, your hope can become hollow unless it's a living hope. Now remember the setting, who it is that got this letter in their inbox. Peter wants these Christians who have had to run for their lives and leave their homes and settle in some other province. He wants them to know and he wants you to know that if you have this living hope in Jesus, it will produce joy, even in the midst of suffering. And the result will be a strengthened faith. That's what he's saying. Your faith will be stronger. Your relationship with the Lord will be tighter. You see, you can't claim he's your living hope and then cave in when others question your faith. You can't have a testimony without a test. And trials are the proof of your faith. There's a greater good that comes out of suffering. And God isn't some maniacal mastermind who gets his jollies over our pain. Not at all. The Bible says that he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. That's who he is. That's what he does. But the Bible also tells us that Satan has come to steal to kill, and to destroy. And rest assured, what God permits, he has the ability to work for good. David Jeremiah says it like this. He says, it seems to be the universal testimony of those who suffer that it is a very clarifying experience for them. Pain is a type of preparation like no other, allowing the unimportant to fall away and the critical to rise to the top. And ultimately, that's what God wants in your life. He wants to rise to the top. 
He wants to be number one. He wants to be the Lord. He wants to be the master of your life. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says this. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Some translations say, take courage. Keep the big picture. Those words give us hope in a world of hurt. No matter what life might throw at us, we have put our faith in someone who is an overcomer. The tomb is empty. The tomb couldn't keep our living hope down. God has robbed the grave. In our living hope, Jesus Christ is reminding us that he is worthy of our pursuit. He is a tried and tested hope. And Peter is telling the early Christians, you have to decide where your hope is because there may be ridicule, there may be suffering, and you need to finish the race. I, I tell you, I, I love watching these Olympics. I, I, I love watching the races. I, I, I love watching, I love watching the, uh, all the different competitions. I, I told Beth, if we have three more kids, we're going to name them Simone, Allie, and Usain. Uh, <laughs> but you watch these long-distance races, and you see these people at the end, and I mean, they're just chugging along with everything they've got, and they're perspiring away. And it all comes down to that finish. And you see how some of them, they just throw themselves across. Can I tell you something? The race that you are in, the Christian life that you are in, is more important than any Olympic. And you gotta finish. And you gotta finish well. In the past few weeks, God has been teaching me that for too long, I think I've just been guilty of just praying for an easy life. I have this tendency just to Pray, Lord, just, you know, I, I just want things to go smoothly. And uh, when things start to go wrong, I'm very quick to pray and say, oh, Lord, get, get me out of this. <laughs> get me out of this one. And this last week, I was reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul as he sat in a prison cell and, and he wrote these words to the church at Philippi. He said, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So Paul writes from a prison cell, it's been granted to you not only to believe in Christ, but you also get to suffer for Christ. Isn't that good news? And the first century Christians, when they heard that, they agreed it was good news. What's the difference between a 20th century, 21st century Christian and a first century Christian? How is it that when the book of Acts tells us that when the apostles were flogged and they were beaten for preaching the name of Jesus Christ, that they left and it says they rejoiced? Why would they rejoice? It tells us why. Because they were worthy of suffering disgrace for his name. See, my tendency when I pray is to try to avoid suffering or ridicule or persecution. But what if rather than trying to avoid it, what if I, rather than fearing it, what if instead I accepted it as a way to look more like Christ? Not in some masochistic manner of, oh, I, I wanna suffer, not like that. But so that people can see that when, when I suffer, my attitude is good only because of my faith in the living hope in Jesus Christ. You see, suffering in any form will either draw you to God or it will drive you from God. One of those two things. I got a text from a guy last night, his wife of over uh, 30 some years uh, passed away just a few months ago, back in March. And he said, I really appreciate the sermon. He said, it's been the toughest time of my entire life. But he said, Dave, my faith is so much stronger. Why? Because he's drawn close to Christ in the midst of his pain. After the North American Christian Convention was over, Beth and I got a letter from a woman uh, who we became friends with out there. 
She wrote, at the start of this year, I made a promise to God that each day for 365 days, whatever he asked me to do, I, I would take a step of faith and I would be obedient. And it has been so exciting to serve him. I wanna be a bond servant of Christ. I feel so lonely out here, knowing the people around me just, just don't get it and they, they don't really understand where I'm coming from. But I'm grateful for the privilege and it motivates me to rise to my calling in Christ and to know that I am not alone in this. As I read, I thought her words sound almost like the Apostle Paul as he wrote from a prison cell. Just the loneliness of being there and people not understanding and I wanna be a, a slave for Christ. I should probably tell you a little bit about this woman who wrote this. She's a 30-something mom. She has five kids married to a pastor for a number of years and serving in a small, very small church and he lost an 18 month battle with cancer. She goes on to write, I never would have chosen this path on my own, but I'm so grateful for my suffering. It has stripped me of so much and left me just a simple girl in pursuit of God, his word and his people. My suffering motivates me to rise to my calling in Christ and to know that I am not alone in this. Now that's not the typical response most young widows with five children would have unless they have a living hope and their hope is named Jesus. And then she can sing the resurrected king is resurrecting me. For though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. You're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Where's your hope? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we... Uh, we pray that our faith will be growing and that it will be active as it is rooted and grounded in our living hope, our resurrected King. So Lord, we ask that uh, in the face of trials and tribulations, in the face of sadness and suffering, that we will turn our attention to you, that we will long for that inheritance and that we will look forward to the day when we will see you face to face and we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye and all these things that are so painful and difficult that we go through uh, will evaporate into oblivion as we stand before our living hope. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may not have ever uh, named the name of Jesus above all other names, and you may have never said, I'm going to let him rise to the top of my life, and I'm going to make him the Lord and Savior of my life. Well, today, all of that could change. And you could accept him and name him as the Lord of your life. There are others of you who have been coming southeast for some time and say, boy, I, this, this is the church where I want to serve, where I want to give, where I want to minister, where I want to grow, where I want to worship. You want to make this your church home. Whatever your decision is, uh, you meet me down front. You need somebody to pray for you. You're going through a really difficult time. We have a group of prayer warriors that would love to pray for you. Whatever your, your decision, whatever you're going through, you meet me down front as we stand, as we worship you.